Shalom, shalom. We're picking back up in our backgrounds of the New Testament study, looking at honor and shame. Honor and shame. Again, I recommend these two books, the Greco world, uh, the Greco Roman world of the New Testament, and also honor, patronage, kinship, and uh, kinship and purity. Excellent book. I want to read a little bit here from chapter two, honor and shame in the New Testament. So the early Christians proclaimed a message and stood for values that differed from and indeed it, and indeed contradicted core values within the dominant Greco-Roman culture, as well as the Jewish subculture within which the church arose. Now we, we, we get triggered by words and I know I say this all the time and I just want to say it one more time. We have Christians who were uh, mostly Jewish, and they were believers in Yeshua. Um, you can call them early messianics, whatever you want to call them. And then when we're dealing with the church, the uh, ecclesia, or some say ecclesia, you can call that the messianic congregations, whatever makes you feel better. Just don't read sources and get triggered by words and put the sources down. Just continue to read and study and grow. Again, we are very intelligent individuals. We don't have to get upset or triggered by words. So their non-Christian neighbors, therefore, subjected the early Christians to censor and other shaming techniques designed to bring these deviant people back in line with the values and behaviors held dear by the surrounding culture, whether Jewish or Greco-Roman. The authors of the New Testament devote much of their attention, therefore, to insulating their congregations from the effects of these shaming techniques, calling the hearers to pursue lasting honor before the court of God, whose verdict is eternal. These authors continue to use the language of honor and shame to articulate the value system of the Christian group and to build up the church or ecclesia or messianic congregation into a court of reputation that will reinforce commitment to those values by honoring those who distinguish themselves in acts of love, service, and faithful witness, and by censoring those who fail to embody those values. So let's take another look. Shame and honor. And we're just going to read to right here because we're going to look at some things in Yeshua's genealogy. And then when we come back, we'll jump into acquired honor. So shame and honor. Honor and shame were values that shaped everyday life in biblical times. Honor, the primary measure of social status, was based upon ascribed honor and acquired honor. So there was two ways to receive honor. Inherited or ascribed honor was social standing due to being part of a social unit. Principally, the family. Those born to rulers and leaders were held in high esteem due to family honor. Jewish preoccupation with genealogies ensured inherited honor was secure. Matthew uh, chapter 1, 1 through 17, and Luke chapter 3, 23 through 38, gives genealogies for Yeshua or Jesus that highlight the high status claimed for him. In Matthew, Yeshua's pedigree is right, both as to Jewishness, a direct link to Abraham, and his right to be king of the Jews, descended from David. Luke traces Yeshua's lineage through Adam to God, claiming Yeshua's right to be savior of all mankind. Now, everybody's read Matthew chapter 1, I hope. Uh, Matthew chapter 1, 1 through 17. And I want to just look at how the honor actually is increased in that genealogy. So the writer now segues into a rather lengthy genealogical list that gives further details of the qualifications of Yeshua as the Messiah King. While many readers may be tempted to skip these details, this list answers some important questions. Various names in the genealogy are familiar, such as Yaakov, Boaz, and Shlomo, Solomon, Jacob, Boaz, and Solomon. Many others are less uh, are lesser known, yet vital connections in the ancestry of Yeshua. From a Jewish perspective, these details are not only incumbent upon, but also quite enlightening to the Messianic qualifications. Several points should be highlighted. First, 
The Davidic emphasis of Matthew's account is affirmed once again. This is seen in the division of the list into three distinct groups, as the writer himself confirms, and you can see in verse 17. So a closer study of the list reveals that there are gaps between names, sometimes of several generations. Now, an anti-missionary is going to come in and, and try to use all these things, pay it no mind, continue to study that way that you can uh, hopefully, hopefully you don't run into this type of confrontation, but you'll be able to um, get your point across and not allow your faith to be shaken. So sometimes uh, there's gaps between names, sometimes of several generations. This is allowed in the Jewish way of recording genealogies, as the word for son can many times mean a descendant who is not an immediate progeny. And we can see this in Ezra chapter 2 and Nehemiah chapter 7. This practice is justified many times if the writer has a particular point to make. In Matthew's case, he is clearly focusing on the three sets of 14 names. While some commentators seem bewildered by this fact, there is good Jewish reasoning implemented here by the writer. Anyone familiar with Hebrew knows that from ancient times, the language had a numeric value associated with each of its letters. It is not coincidental that one of the numeric values of the number 14 may be expressed in the three Hebrew letters, Dalit, which is four, Vav, or some say Wa, six, Dalit, four again. So the Hebrew letters for David equals 14. By intentionally skipping over particular names that could have been included in this list or in the list, the writer is emphasizing the Davidic connection to Yeshua as King Messiah, the son of David. So there's added honor, which is um, ascribed honor to Yeshua and his genealogy. Next, we'll pick up with acquired honor. Um, so we can see the difference between uh, honor that was inherited and honor that was ascribed. And we're going to look at Abba Abraham. Shalom, shalom. 